Welcome to Clear Creek Community Church Online. My name is Chris Austin. I'm the pastor of our 528 campus. Clear Creek is made up of multiple campuses located throughout the Bay Area of Houston. And while we are so glad you joined us here to watch the sermon today, you should know that we believe that life is better when we do it together. So when we gather as a church, it's a non-downloadable experience. Singing together, praying together, serving together are all things that just, they don't translate online but they're essential to the entire experience of becoming a fully devoted follower of Jesus Christ. So I would encourage you, make plans to check out the campus nearest you and see what worshiping and living in community is really all about. You can visit us at clearcreek.org to find information about our locations, service times, and much more. We hope to see you soon. There's recently a thread on Reddit where someone asked the question, why do people think Christians are dumb? Well, it's because of the internet, you can imagine some of the things that people posted on there, but here's just a taste of a few of the responses. This is what Stump Dog says. So why, do Christians, why are Christians dumb? Uh, probably because there are a bunch of loudmouth morons claiming to be Christian that refuse to not be heard above the masses. All right. CJ Owen says, actually, Christianity is stupid. Believing in God just because you feel that he's real and because some guy reading from an old book told you it was without ever seeing any proof in any way, shape, or form to prove his existence is a definition of stupid. So anyone who believes in something without proof is a moron. Moron's a favorite word here. So Per Junkie says the majority of Christians are ignorant about science, philosophy, and arguably their own beliefs. And then finally, EDM Ostrich, he concedes that there are brilliant Christians, but as a group, not so much. Now, obviously you can't base your life on things that you read in the comment section on the internet, but doesn't some of this sentiment ring true for you within, within our culture at least? This, this is how Christianity might be perceived. Maybe you see this in the media and TV or movies, or maybe you experience it personally, in your relationships with friends or family or coworkers. It's not uncommon for someone to, to label Christians as anti-intellectuals, right? People who are ignorant, but not just regular inf- ignorant, they're, they're willfully ignorant about things like philosophy and science and even their own beliefs. That to be a Christian means to, to check your brain at the door. So why is this the case? Why is this the perception of Christianity today? Why do some people think Christians are dumb? And what are we supposed to do about it? Because that's an important question for us. I mean, some of this has caused some people to rethink their faith because like, why do I want to be associated with something that's anti-intellectual? I want to be someone who uses my mind. And there's some people who reject Christianity outright because it's viewed as maybe irrational in their mind, silly. It's just a bunch of myths that you shouldn't really believe. So that's what we're going to talk about today. Before we get into what the Bible says and and how we can address this within our own lives, I want us to begin with a a historical overview of how we got to where we are today. So because this really wasn't always the case for us. You think about the history of the world, history of of Christianity and Western civilization, it it wasn't always the case that that Christianity was viewed as anti-intellectual and anti-science. For many centuries, Christians have been the intellectual and scientific thought leaders around the world. Many of the great philosophers and scientists in history were Christians. In fact, Francis Bacon, who was uh, credited with essentially establishing the scientific method and uh, therefore really our our understanding of how we understand our world is credited to, to him. He invented modern science, if you will. He was a Christian. And so far from being anti-science, many people who have professed to be Christians uh, like him and like Galileo and Johannes Kepler and uh, Robert Boyle and Blaise Pascal, just to name a few, they were the early pioneers and contributors to our modern way of, of understanding the scientific world around us. And so it's important for us to know that, that Christianity was not seen as at odds with knowledge and reason. As America was being founded into the the middle 1800s, Christianity was vigorously intellectual and deeply concerned with the life of the mind. 117 of the first 119 colleges, universities that were founded in the United States were founded not just on Christian principles, but explicitly Christian uh, purposes. This is what's in Harvard College's founding documents. It says this, let every student 
be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his life and studies is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, found in John 17, 3. And therefore, to lay Christ in the bottom as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. I mean, that's one of the founding purposes of Harvard. And you can find a similar statement in many of the founding documents of major universities and colleges all around the country. You can find scripture passages put on libraries and other buildings all around campuses. Now, Today, many of those schools would probably like to distance themselves from those historical Christian principles that were part of their their founding. So what happened? Well, there's a number of things that happened. In the middle of the 1800s and late 1800s, there were some significant movements within Christianity, movements where God worked in some really powerful ways. People came to faith in Jesus. Lives were transformed. Like it was this beautiful thing But but many of those movements also tended to be anti-intellectual in nature. Many of them placed a a great emphasis on emotions and and feelings, right? And which only caused in some people's minds to to reduce faith to merely being something about having deep religious character and deep religious feelings in your heart. Now, emotions and feelings are not bad things, right? God, God wants us to have emotions and feelings, But what happened was a a divide began to emerge, a divide between knowledge and reason on one hand and faith and feelings on the other hand. Added to that, there was this growing secularization within our society, stemming from the Enlightenment, many of the the main educational institutes and mainline Christian church denominations uh, began to to sort of move in another direction. This was about the time of Darwin's origins of species in, in 1859 which eventually led to some public debates and trials around uh, the teaching of evolution. Uh, Many of you might be familiar with the Scopes Monkey Trial in 1925, which essentially pitted science that's based on knowledge and reason against religions that are based on faith and feelings. And in response to this growing secular movement within society, Christians got together to figure out how they were going to retake some of these institutions, right? how they were going to fight against it. So many of them took up some political strategies to do so, to essentially kick the liberals out of these institutions. But what happened was it backfired and they were kicked out. And so this began to... uh, 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 people started to start new Christian colleges and some new conservative denominations, which were, were good things, right? And, and many of those Christian uh, educational institutions have grown to become some outstanding places where you can learn and grow and discover all of these different uh, truths about the world around us. But at least initially, they weren't seen as that. They were seen as places where Christians kind of went to go hide their heads in the sand, right? Where they sort of checked their brain at the door. And so one of the byproducts began this greater divide between knowledge and reason and faith and feelings. And we still see some of this today. We still see an increasingly secular culture, marginalization of Christianity. We still have political and culture wars that are being fought and argued over. And while this isn't true for everyone everywhere, there's still this perception that to believe the core tenets of Christianity, you have to abandon knowledge and reason. You have to check your brain at the door and you just have to believe with blind faith and feelings. But this simply isn't true. Historically, this isn't true. Christians were once known as the culture and thought leaders of their day. They were the artists and the authors and the philosophers and the scientists. The church was responsible for the rapid increase in the global literacy rate and mass education. And so historically, Christianity wasn't at odds with knowledge and reason. And biblically, this isn't true either. I mean, let's look at Matthew 22 to see what Jesus says about this. So Matthew 22, verse 34 says this, but when the Pharisees heard that Jesus had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, so someone who's an expert in the Old Testament Jewish law, he asked Jesus a question to test him. Now, before we look at what their question is and how Jesus responds, I want you to look at the the context of this. The context of the conversation. So Jesus is talking to the, the foremost like 
intellectual elite of their day. I mean, these guys were highly trained, highly educated. I mean, they, they would debate about the most minute topic, discussion, words in the Old Testament. I mean, these guys were the thought leaders of their day. And you look at what just happened. Jesus apparently had silenced the Sadducees, which was one of the, the religious leaders and the scholars. There were two major ones, the Sadducees and the Pharisees, both these scholars who, who knew their, their Bible, right? They would get into these different debates. They had a, a kind of a rivalry going between the two groups. They would get into these debates and they were trying to constantly one-up each other. They didn't really like each other very much. And so before this conversation, apparently, the, the Sadducees had tried to stump Jesus, they tried to ask him some questions and get him all tied up into some mental knot so that he would have to slink away with his tail between his legs. And they would look like they were the, the heroes because everyone would stop following Jesus and now think the, the Sadducees were something great. But it backfired on them. Right? Jesus bests them and he sends them going. And so now the Pharisees ha realize that they have an opening. They have an opportunity to get a twofer, right? They can make Jesus look silly, but also they can look like they're better than the Sadducees. So they come up with a question to silence Jesus, to try to get him in some mental knots. So just think about that. Most of the time, we don't think of Jesus as this intellectual culture maker. We think of him as a caring and loving figure that he is, but he was also this intellectually sophisticated man. I mean, no doubt, he, he preached and he interacted with people from all walks of life, all different education levels, he talked to fishermen and he talked to farmers. I mean, he talked to soldiers and tax collectors. He talked to everyone. And he also went toe to toe and debated and dialogued with the intellectual elite of his day. Enough where he handed it to them on numerous occasions. And so Jesus himself was no intellectual slouch. I mean, that's significant for us to point out that he didn't teach a faith that is separate from, from knowledge and reason, but he, he taught a faith, that faith and knowledge are interconnected. Right? They're, they're intimately related to each other. To see that, let's read the question that the Pharisees offer up to Jesus in his response. This is the question they ask him in verse 36. Teacher, which is the great commandment in the law? And so this is what Jesus says, verse 37. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So they asked Jesus, what's the great commandment, right? What's the, the number one thing that we should get out of the Old Testament law? Jesus gives them two commandments. The first one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. Love your neighbor as yourself. So he summarizes all the Old Testament law under those two commands. Love God and love your neighbor. And he says that loving God emanates from your heart, your soul, and your mind. In other words, it's your whole self, right? Like it's, it's all the parts of you, all of your faculties are involved in, in loving God. God's not content with us just loving him with, with two out of those three. And so for Jesus, there's not a divide between the, the heart and the soul and the mind, Right? It's not like, oh, the, the heart and the soul, that's where faith and feeling is located and the mind is where knowledge and reason are and those are totally separated in loving God and following him. But instead, we're to love God with our whole selves, including our mind. And so that begs the question, how do you love God with your mind? I mean, how do you love anything with your mind for that matter? I mean, a lot of times when we think about love, we don't think of it as something that, that we do with our minds. We, we tend to think of love as a romantic kind of love. That's how it's portrayed in movies. Love is something that you passively fall into, right? You fall in love. Love is mainly just a, a feeling in our minds. It's the, the warm and fuzzies. It's all about the heart and not about the mind, all about the heart. That's why people say uh, the heart is what it wants, the heart wants what it wants, uh, 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 right? Selena Gomez, some of y'all know? Some of you in the know, that's all right. But we think it, it has nothing to do with our minds. It's all the heart. It's all the soul. In fact, we think that the more that it has to do with our mind, the less loving it actually is. That it, if our love involves our reasoning, our mind, or our will, it kind of feels like, man, it's not so authentic, right? It's kind of forced. 
Like you would never tell someone, listen, I've made a bunch of observations about you. I've considered the evidence of your assets and all of your flaws. And I've come to the reasonable conclusion that it makes sense for me to love you. Right? I mean, if that's your line, I'm sorry. But she probably doesn't say I love you too when you say that. Right? (laughs) So we think of love as only located in the heart and not the mind. That it's just a feeling. But it's just romanticism. Right? That's not how the Bible describes what love is. Love is more than a feeling, right? Some of you, that's for the people who don't know who Selena Gomez is, all right? (laughs) It's more than a feeling, though. And all of our cultural ideas of love contributes to this understanding, this thinking that love is not something that we do with our minds and our wills and our reasoning. We think that it only has to do with the emotions that you feel, And what happens is is eventually there's this time of life where we maybe don't feel those warm and fuzzy feelings. I mean, that's when people say, ah, we just, we fell out of love. And so listen, if you have a a relationship or a marriage that's based on simply just the the feelings of the heart without much consideration for the mind or the will or, or commitment, it gets really shaky when those feelings fade or when they fluctuate. Because that's what emotions and feelings can do is they they can fluctuate over time. And if that causes you to to, to throw it all out, well, then it's not really based on something that's solid, but it's only based on feelings and emotions. And this is the same with loving God. If your relationship with God is, is based on emotions, if you can only say, I know God exists and I know that he loves me because it, it feels true in my heart. Then when someone presents an argument, that causes you to to question. Or when you go through something in life that makes you wonder, man, is God present? Does he really love me? And those emotions subside, well, then your faith gets rocked, right? It gets shaken. You start asking questions like, maybe I don't believe this. Maybe my emotions were just stirred by all the music. Maybe I was just looking for community and friendship, and so I convinced myself that I believed what everyone else around me believed. Maybe God doesn't actually exist. You see, for some people, that kind of experience has caused them to question and deconstruct and and for some even deconvert from Christianity. But that's why we have to to reclaim intellectualism. We have to reclaim the pursuit of God with our minds. We have to not just feel God, although we do, we also have to, to know God. As Jesus says, we're to love God with all of us, our heart, our soul, and our mind. And to love God, you have, to, you have to know him, right? You can't love what you don't know. You might be able to get emotionally stirred up or entertained, but that's not love. You can't love what you don't know. So you have to know God to love God. And that starts by first knowing how he has loved us. This is how the Bible talks about loving God in 1 John 4.10. In this is love, not that we've loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So when Jesus says that the great commandment is to love God with your, your whole self, he knows that that begins by knowing how God has first loved us. That God makes the first move. And we get this ultimate picture of God's love for us in the person and the work of Jesus. This is what we call the the good news of the gospel. That while we were sinners separated from God because of our brokenness and our sin, God loved us enough to, to send his son to live a perfect life, a sinless life, and to die on the cross and to be resurrected as a propitiation, as a substitute, as a payment for our sin, so that we might be washed clean of all of our sin and brokenness, all of our past, our present, even the things that we might do in the future. By faith in Jesus, we will be reconciled to God. So our salvation and our security isn't based on feeling loved by God, but it is knowing we're loved by God. Why? Well, because we can point to a literal, historical cross and empty tomb. We can be confident that there was a literal, historical person who walked the earth and made a claim that he is God and that he would be raised from the dead and that there is evidence that that tomb, in fact, was empty. 
We can know those things to be true. And so listen, if you're wrestling with Christianity, if you're exploring faith, or maybe you're even rethinking and questioning your faith to see what you really believe about this, know that God doesn't want you to check your brain at the door. A mindless Christianity is not Christianity. He wants you to know him, right? He, with your mind, he wants you to have a relationship with him, to, to love him with all that you are, your heart, your soul, and your mind in response to how he first loved you in Christ. And so if that's where you are, I would encourage you to begin your journey by investigating who Jesus is. There is a literal man who walked the earth that changed everything, right? 2.3 billion people follow him, claim him as Lord and Savior. He has changed the, the history of the world. Who do you believe this man is? What do you believe about him? So begin there. Begin with him and his love for you in the gospel. And if you are a follower of Jesus, know this, that to be a Christian is to live a thoughtful life, to love God with everything, including your mind. And so how do we love God with our minds, right? How do we live a thoughtful life? I wanna give you three things that we must know, and then I wanna give us some resources that we can use to help us know these things. So to love God with our whole minds, we have to, to know three things. The first one is to, to know who you believe in. Know who you, who you believe in. You have to know God as he's revealed himself in scriptures, in the Bible. One of the charges against many Christians today is they simply just don't even know what's in the Bible. They just don't read it. Maybe they know some scripture passages because they get posted on social media with some pretty backgrounds or they show up on a mug or on a t-shirt or something like that. But the tradition of Christians reading and studying and knowing and memorizing the scripture is not as strong as it once was. 2 Timothy 3.16 says this about the Bible, that all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. See, we believe that the Bible is God's word, right? It's spoken by God. It's written by human authors under the supernatural guidance and inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? Christians have, have always affirmed that the Bible is a supreme source for truth about beliefs and for living. And the only way to understand and to discover the truths that, that God has revealed in Scripture is to read it yourself, and when you do, well, then you're going to be better equipped to handle those shifting emotions that you might experience as you go through life. Like when you experience something in life that causes you to wonder, man, is God in control? Does he love me? Does he even exist? You can go back to those passages like 1 John 4.10. And be reminded and stand firm on this truth that, yes, God exists. And yes, God loves you because you've stored that truth up in your heart and also in your head. And so read the Bible. That's the resource I want to encourage you to, to read and discover so that you know who you believe in. And if you don't have one, this is a church. We got free ones somewhere around here. Go by the Welcome Center. We'll give you one. And if you don't know where to start, start by reading the Gospel of John. It tells about the life and the ministry and the teaching of Jesus so you can learn from Jesus yourself. And if you need some helpful resources to help you understand some of those things, I encourage you to get a, an ESV study Bible or you can attend our How to Study the Bible class that we'll have later on in the fall. And better yet, I would encourage you not to do this alone, but to join up a small group of other people who are reading and studying and trying to apply the scripture to their life. So to love God with your mind, you have to know God as he's revealed himself in pages of scripture. The second way we can love God with our minds is to know what you believe. It's like Per Junkie on Reddit said, the majority of Christians are ignorant about science, philosophy, and even their own beliefs. So you have to know what you believe. And I'd also say it, it's helpful to know the core beliefs that, that Christians have historically stacked their hands on. And studying theology can do that. So if you go to our website, you click on About Us, you would see all of our essential beliefs. And if you were to read those, you would notice they sound 
pretty generic. They sound like a lot of other church essential beliefs. But you should know this. When you read through a church's essential beliefs, that many of those, as generic as they might sound, have been carefully crafted. They've been formed by Scripture. Throughout the history of the church, they've been debated. And so they're not to be taken for granted. So I would encourage you to, to start there, to, to know where those beliefs have come from. What are the historical beliefs that Christians have stacked hands on? So study theology. Now, I realize that whenever I say study theology, some of you just sort of glass over a little bit there. Like on Clear Creek Resources, when we post a, a podcast that has theology anywhere in the title at all, I mean, just the views, downloads plummet, right? But I'll tell you, though, if you were to check out some of those resources, though, you would find that they are very interesting and very helpful for you. In fact, our most popular class throughout the history of Clear Creek has been a systematic theology class. And so a couple of resources I want to encourage you to check out as you explore what you believe are both written by Wayne Grudem. One is Systematic Theology. This is the book that we use for our class. Uh, it's 1,600 pages, right? So it's, 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 a, it's some work, all right? Now, if I haven't sold you on that one yet, he does write a smaller one that's about 200 pages, okay? It's 20 basic beliefs of Christianity. So I'd encourage you. I mean, snap a picture of that. Uh, if you go to clearcreekresources.org, we have links to all these things right now. But to, to explore what you believe about theology, about the things of God, that's one of the ways that we love God with our minds. The third way is to not just know what we believe, but to know why you believe it. Know why you believe what you believe. And at least be somewhat able to explain why you believe it. I mean, that's what apologetics is. I mean, we study apologetics. Apologetics is the defense of the Christian faith. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be someone who gets into debates and arguments and always you're pushing back with people and talking about all the different issues. Some people are wired that way, and that's great. And some people are not really wired and that's okay too. But I would encourage you to, to know what you believe and why you believe it in a way that you might be able to explain to someone else. 1 Peter 3.15 says this, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. So know what you believe, right? like know the, the hope that is in you and know why you believe it so that you can explain to somebody else who wants to know, why do you have this hope, right? Like why do you live this way, right? Like what makes you tick? Why are you different? And you have an opportunity to explain it, the hope that you have. And this last part's important, right? To do it with gentleness and respect, Sam Trangelisons just, just say, don't be a jerk about it, all right? That's not true, but it might as well say that, right? To, to do it with gentleness and grace and understanding, to be able to ask good questions of someone else about what they believe and to be able to dialogue and engage. So be prepared. Be prepared to, to answer some questions that people have because people have questions. And if you were to think about it, you probably have a lot of the, the same questions. Even if you feel pretty firm in your faith, there's probably some questions out there that you're like, ah, you know, I have always wanted that myself. Questions like, how could a good God allow suffering and evil in the world? How could a loving God send someone to hell? Hasn't science disproven Christianity? How can you say that there's only one true faith? Hasn't Christianity historically denigrated women? Hasn't Christianity uh, condoned slavery? I mean, these are questions that people ask. And as intimidating as those questions might feel and sound to you, there are good answers to them. I mean, Christians throughout the ages have used their minds and their reasoning to, to think about and to come up with satisfying answers to those very questions. And so I would encourage you to, to pursue answers to questions like that. So you might be able to engage and explain the hope that you have in Christ. A couple of great resources to help you in that. Reason for God by Tim Keller and Confronting Christianity by Rebe Rebecca McLaughlin. I would encourage you to get one of these books or both of these books. Again, snap pictures or go to Clear Creek Resources. You can get links for those there. 
But I'd also encourage you to, to maybe even check out our starting point class. So we do a starting point class throughout the year. Uh, even if you're, uh, if you're exploring faith in Jesus or you feel pretty solid in what you believe about Christ, it's a great class that helps you to think and engage and, and wrestle with some tough questions. So listen, I, I get that I just listed off a whole bunch of classes you should take and a whole bunch of books that you should read. And you're like, I don't know if I'm going to get to all that stuff. I will say all of these books are available on audiobooks. So if you're not really a reader, but you can listen to things, I would encourage you to do that as well. But I do believe that's what it looks like to, to love God with your mind, right? To, to think, to, to challenge yourself to, to do this work, to, to push yourself a little. To think that Christianity is anti-intellectual is not consistent with history, nor is it consistent with what God says it looks like to, to love him and to follow him. There's not a divide between knowledge and reason and faith and feelings. God calls us to love him with our whole selves. Because again, this is all just rooted in, in love. Right? The aim isn't to add more facts to your, your mental catalog, but to result in a life that's fully submitted to God, loving him with all that you are and loving others. So on Reddit, people might think that Christians are dumb because they don't think critically or deeply about things. But you have the opportunity to change that. You have the opportunity to, to engage with people dialogue with them, love them, and God can use you in their life as you do so. C.S. Lewis, he wrote, I believe in Christianity as I believe that the sun has risen in the sky, not only because I see it, but because by it I see everything else. If you know C.S. Lewis' story, you know that he was an, an atheist before he would ever say something like that. In fact, he was an intellectual, right? One of the intellectual elite. He was a professor of English literature at Oxford and Cambridge, like top universities in the world. And from the age of 15 onward, he was uh, declared uh, an atheist. He was angry with the concept of God. But eventually, after reading and studying, thinking, debating with some of his faculty friends like J.R. Tolkien, Finally, he, he described what happened to him one night. He says, I gave in and admitted that God was God and knelt and prayed. Perhaps that night, the most dejected and reluctant convert in all England. See, he had always, always resisted God, right? He, he didn't come willingly. He had to, to think through things, right? That, that's one of the things that God used to, to lead him to faith in Jesus, to wrestle with things in his mind. But after studying and debating and arguing, something clicked. Clicked in his heart, in his soul, and in his mind. And he gave his life to Christ, his whole self. And he went on to become one of the, the great writers of Christian apologetics. And to this day, some of his books have convince some and help people work through the, the legitimacy of faith in Jesus. And so let me encourage you, don't check your brain at the door, but dive in, learn, right? Use your knowledge and your reason together with faith and feelings to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Would you bow with me? Our Father, we are grateful that you loved us enough to send Jesus to live among us as a historical man, to walk the very same earth that we walk every day, to live a life like us, but yet he was sinless. We're grateful that he lived that sinless life and died on the cross for us so that we might know you, we might be washed clean from all of our sin, past, present, and future, and we might be reconciled to you. God, let us be a people who, in response to your love for us, would love you with our whole selves, not just our heart and our soul, but also our minds, that we would be those who dig deeper and seek to, to learn about you as you've revealed yourself in Scripture, to explore the, the infinite depth 
of who you've revealed yourself to be. Let us be continually in awe of you. God, would you help us to be people who pursue these things in a way that we might be able to explain it to others, to walk alongside them as they are struggling and questioning. May we be those who engage in dialogue and love others to explain and share the hope that we've found in Christ. And may we be a part of someone else's story as they have wrestled through the truth of scripture and the truth of the gospel and submitted themselves to you, God. And let us be a part of their story. We give this to you in the name of Jesus. Amen.